In this second part, we continue our exploration of the concept of behavior. Specifically, we want to now look at some ideas about well, how we even think about the causes of behavior as another important element to look at in education for sustainable development. And so generally, we can think about that people might have in any one situation, looking at any one problem, might have different ideas and intuitions about what causes a particular behavior that we're trying to understand. So something that might come to mind that we intuitively just reason is that it's all about innate tendencies and genes. He does that because that's just in his genes and similar phrases like this. At other times, we might be more bringing up explanations that have to do more with the brain, like what's going on in your mind. Um, other times, we kind of try to understand people's intentions and thoughts. How could you do that? What were you thinking? And other times, and other people might more bring in things about the local culture and the social environment that people are in that might influence how they do what they do and how they think. Now, of course, in reality, it's really all of those and more things together that we need to be able to bring together if we really want to have an understanding about why people might behave the way they do. And so here are just some important conceptions, again, about causes of behavior. We could consider the misconceptions depending on how we want to interpret and approach these, these ideas. So one of them is that people might really think behavior is mostly the result of innate tendencies and genes. And we can possibly attribute this to this emphasis in biology and then also consequently in culture on genes and genetics as an important um, yeah, scientific uh, movement or discovery in the last half century, which might have created the notion that most of our traits can basically be explained by our genes. Now, of course, many times people don't really think that, but we still can see that oftentimes um, people argue about why people are the way they are because of some deterministic notion that uh, based on their genes. However, this kind of explanation is often not sufficient and it's often not the case, especially for behavioral traits. And this notion might even lead to problems in how we relate to ourselves and how we interact with each other, because if we're really thinking that certain traits are based on genes, then of course this makes it much more difficult to change those traits and to change the causes. Another important conception that is going the other way is the yeah is the intuition that behaviors are mostly caused or the result of conscious intentions con conscious goals that we set ourselves now it depends of course on the situation but often this is also not the case in fact human behavior is often quite automatic and caused by many different factors some of which we are often not even aware of and this also will change how we relate to our own behaviors and the behaviors of people around us and how we approach different solutions about how we might change our own and other people's behaviors. And so in this module, we will especially also explore some of those behaviors, outer behaviors that are in fact quite often automatic or unconscious and how we can deal with them better. For example, we will look at one approach um, called nudging which explores how our outer behaviors can be influenced by things we are not even aware of and how, and how we might use this understanding to improve um, how we behave in the world. We will also explore the difference between our unconscious and conscious thinking processes in the fast and slow thinking section of the module. And finally, we'll also explore how we can use the two types of behaviors of our mind, values and mindfulness, to increase our awareness and reflection on valued behavior. Now, as I said, in reality, really, the human behavior is caused by many different factors and dynamics. But of course, this complexity can quickly be overwhelming. And so we have developed this set of so-called causal domains to help us a little bit put them into, into buckets and reason uh, about what kinds of different factors might we bring into a, an explanation of a certain behavior at any one time. 
ranging from genes, but not just genes, but also human body, what's going on in the brain, what kind of technologies, cultural knowledge and social environment do individuals live in that influence how they think and behave, and how does also maybe the abiotic biotic environment influence behavior, and in turn, how does behavior influence all these things as well. We're dealing with a lot of interactions too. Here's a quote by behavioral biologist Robert Sapolsky that summarizes this fact. He says, there are a few, few clear-cut causal agents. So don't count on there being the brain region, the neurotransmitter, the gene, the cultural influence, or the single anything that explains a behavior. So he is saying that often we, we like to maybe look for one particular causal factor that helps us finally explain something, but in reality, we really have to look at several of these and put them all together in one um, explanation of behavior. And so this is to really help us understand the complexity of causes of behavior and other phenomena. We like to use this teaching tool, causal maps or causal diagrams, to help us explore and understand complex causal relationships between factors, including the causes and consequences of human behavior. So in any one content or situation, we can explore what's the role of the brain in, in behavior or the body and genes or the social environment or other factors in the environment, also technologies, how do they interact with our behavior, and so on. So even though it's complex, it doesn't mean that we always have to have the full map in front of us. Depending on the content, we can choose to focus on a particular causal relationship that we try to understand. Here's an example of a causal map that we will also be looking at again later in the module that helps us understand the uh, complexities in a particular sustainability problem, for example, where we might look at certain human behaviors that have to do with how we use resources or consume certain products and technologies, maybe also the role of our social behavior in influencing how we make decisions and how we relate to others, how does all this maybe affect um, our available resources, and ultimately, how does all this affect our health and well-being, and also the well-being and resilience of ecosystems and the climate, for example. Another te important teaching tool that we like to use to help really uh, get some clarity about the diversity of different causes of human behavior is Tinbergen's questions. They're named after the ethologist Nicolas Tinbergen, who lived in the 20th century. And these are really kind of a helpful heuristic little framework or model for exploring and sorting different types of causes of behavior into four categories. The first is to look at what are some immediate triggers and proximate physiological mechanisms that really triggered and, and caused the behavior. And in the time frame of just milliseconds to minutes, what happened in the environment so that, that the individual reacted to, what happened in the brain, what kind of hormones were active, and so on. Then another set of causes is to look at the development, developmental history of the individual that we're looking at, the learning history. How come this individual tends to now react like this? Where, how, where does this? how was this kind of behavior learned? Who influenced that individual during its development? Then another set of causes is to look in the ancestral or really the past history of the population that this individual is part of. That can include the cultural and the evolutionary history going back really millions of years to understand is this kind of behavior, do we see that in other species as well, to really help us understand the deep history of that kind of behavior. And finally, one set of causes is to look at the function of the behavior or also the adaptive value because that helps us to understand why would an individual repeat the behavior or or not or why would that behavior kind of become more or less common in a population it's to look at does the behavior um, have a function a value for the individual so that the individual keeps on doing it to get something out of it 
And so you can find out more about these Tinbergs questions here on the link on our website and in the teacher guide on, on these pages. And we will be coming back to these over and over again as we're exploring different kinds of human behaviors throughout the module. And so again, if we're looking at this kind of sorting activity where we looked at different kinds of behaviors, we can also think about how all these different examples of behavior, or also there might be some non-examples in there, how they might be caused by the interaction of these different kinds of factors. For example, in some examples, maybe genetics will play a more important role or be more helpful in explaining a behavior. In other behaviors, culture will play a more important role or be more helpful in explaining a behavior and so on. And often all of those need to be integrated to provide us with a full rounded explanation of why someone does uh, behaves the way they do. And so behavioral scientists are trying to understand all these different causes of human behavior through different methods and by comparing humans with other species to understand something about the evolutionary history, for example, comparing humans across ages to understand something about the developmental history and also to compare humans across cultures to understand something about how culture influences us. And as educators, we can similarly explore these causes with students through a range of teaching materials and methods that bring in those kinds of different methods of behavioral science. And this is why we have our different Global ESD content anchors through which we can really bring in different kinds of uh, these different kinds of methods of behavioral science to also help students explore these different kinds of causes, looking at comparing behaviors across different species, including humans, across child development, looking at our ancestors, including uh, th hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, and so on. To summarize, we like the following take on thinking about the causes of behavior by behavioral biologist Robert Sapolsky in his book, uh, Behave. So let's say uh, you observe a behavior has just occurred. Why did it happen? Your first category of explanation is going to be a neurological one. What went on in that person's brain a second before the behavior happened? Now pull out to a slightly larger field of vision. Your next category of explanation a little earlier in time. So we're noticing he's basically doing it by bo going back in time. What sight, sound or smell in the previous seconds to minutes triggered the nervous system to produce that behavior? And on to the next explanatory category. What hormones acted hours to days earlier to change how responsive that individual was to the sensory stimuli that triggered the nervous system to produce the behavior? And by now, you've increased your field of vision to be thinking about neurobiology and the sensory world of our environment and short-term endocrinology, so looking at hormones, in trying to explain what happened. And you just keep expanding, right? It's not that this is now the end of the search. There is still another, uh, other causes going deeper into history. What features of the environment in the prior weeks to years changed the structure and function of that person's brain and thus changed how it responded to those hormones and environmental stimuli? Then you go further back to the childhood of the individual, their fetal environment, and their genetic makeup. And then you increase the view to encompass factors larger than that one individual. How has culture shaped the behavior of people living in that individual's group? What ecological factors helped shape that culture? Expanding and, exp and expanding until considering events umpteen millennia ago and the evolution of that behavior. So we like that quote because it really encompasses a very large view of how we can help, how we can understand and take perspective about where humans come from and why they might behave the way they do in any one situation. And we believe that can help increase perspective taking and empathy and also helps us to understand what, how might we change our environments, our social environments, our culture, um, to help people develop behaviors that are more helpful for themselves and for the world around them. Mm -hmm.